actually there's a, a lot of similarities in what we're going to talk about. So um, despite the fact that we were builders talking about why planning prepares you and why planning doesn't prepare you, I think we're pretty much on the same page. Um, ooh, which way around? Hold on. Is it that? Got it. Yeah, I mean, quite deliberately, mine is entitled The Accidental CEO, because it genuinely was an accident, and that will become apparent as I tell you a little bit about my um, backstory. Um, so, similarly, I was somewhere for a very, very long time. I was at DDB for uh, nearly 19 years, actually, and I started as a grad trainee as soon as I left Oxford ended up as global head of planning um, and was the sort of youngest member of the global exec. So I actually probably did have to sit through an awful lot of uh, P&L meetings being shouted at by John Wren about the fact our margins weren't as good as uh, TBWAs or whoever it was at the time. So um, although I was a planner, I ended up, I guess, in, in kind of management -y roles and felt like I also Although it was one agency, it was BMP, then it was BMP DDB, then it was DDB, and I just got out before it became Adam and Eve DDB. So it was multiple agencies. And then I moved across to uh, Gray, and then um, as CSO, and when the CEO resigned, actually it was before he resigned, it was probably about there were four of us. So there was Nils Leonard, who was our creative director, me, and a guy called Chris Hurst. And when they made Nils Leonard chairman, um, it became apparent quite fast that Chris thought, fuck you, I'm leaving. <laughs> um, it took him about nine months to then go across to uh, become CEO of Havas Group for Europe. Um, so I had a kind of nod on the shoulder at some point saying, if this happens, we sort of getting the feeling Chris isn't very happy. How about, would you like to do it? And I kind of thought, mm, not really, and then carried on with what I was doing. Um, and I guess also, it, it's worth saying it wasn't the first time. Um, when I was at DDB, there was a guy called uh, Stephen Woodford, who was the chief exec, and he'd been there about, I don't know, a year or so, and he sort of sidled up to me one day and went, what do you think? Do you think you'd ever want to be the CEO? How about we do some trip? And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. So, <laughs> so I think there's a kind of common theme that I don't think um, most planners think about their careers that way. Um, sure. uh, Is this the press? Oh yeah, so I'm going to play a little bit of an intro, and this is shameless, it's, um, I can do this because I don't work at Grey any longer, it's actually um, Three Minute Grey, and it's an intro to Grey in three minutes, um, and there is, there is a reason I'm, I'm going to play it, not just because I'm going to show off about an agency I don't work for any longer. Um, Hello, and welcome to Three Minute Grey. Grey London is an open, ambitious collision of almost 500 people based in London's Clerkenwell. That's 500 of the world's best, working in a culture we call open. Open isn't about one way of doing things, it's about doing things the way it works best for every client. That's right, the Grey London client sits at the heart of the team. The heart of a team that work collaboratively, with no hierarchy, ego, or that old school advertising ball and chain, sign off. <laughs> Because at Grey London, we believe that none of us are as smart as all of us, and we don't want anything to slow us down or get in the way of finding the right ideas. The right work? Let's think about that. Traditionally, you can either have cool, famous work, or you can have boring, effective work. But Grey London isn't traditional. At Grey London, the right work is famous and effective. Let's talk about fame. Fame can save lives. The British Heart Foundation wanted to educate the UK to save lives. My name is Vinnie Jones, and I'm going to teach you a lesson you'll never forget. So we grabbed hard man Vinnie Jones and had him teach us hands-only CPR to a tune you can't get out of your head. 200 million views, 45 creative awards, and an infamous black lion for a campaign that didn't just educate the UK, but taught the world globally to make a difference. Famous, great, but the real kicker is that the work worked. 40 people that wouldn't be here if it weren't for the three gangsters and the pop tunes in the 70s. What's more effective than that? Photo got 33 markets around the world not to hang up by getting a couple to never stop kissing. Vodafone's most awarded piece of work ever, with 100 million media impressions, their highest ever share price, and a Greek wedding to answer for. What could be more effective than a Greek wedding? Good question. Kittens, that's what. And puppies, and what the f*** is that? We put 12 kittens in every pack of biscuits and create acute pain across the world from the bees. Time Magazine calling it the cutest thing ever put on television. That was Time Magazine, by the way. Effective, the company hit its highest ever share of market. In the declining sweet foods market, they bucked the trend with 10% rise in sales.
Overnight became the UK's best-selling biscuit. There's only one word for this sort of effective. Sweet. With a T L. Ever wondered how electrolytes and minerals help with hydration in human conditions? Neither had anyone else. Lucas Aid Sport wanted us to address this, focusing on grassroots footballers during the 2014 Brazil World Cup. 99% humidity. It's uncomfortable. While every other brand jumped on the bandwagon to Brazil to shoot TV ads, Lucas Aid went to a disused parking lot in East London and crossed a soccer pitch with a sauna. Set to 76% humidity to replicate the playing conditions of the Amazon Basin, Lucas Aid allowed thousands of amateur footballers to experience what playing in Brazil is actually like for themselves. And in doing so, the conditions only shifted the media attention from the Nels to Miley. Over 100 news pieces reached an estimated 17.3 million people, and sales of Lucas Aid Sport increased by 12%. Effective isn't just about selling stuff. Push me! Volvo's mission is to prevent road accidents. Not just for drivers, but for everyone on the road. We developed an invisible, light reactive paint and gave it away to London's cycling community. Talked about in every civilized country on the planet. 20,000 cans ordered in the first few hours. Production stepped up fourfold to meet global demand. Double Grand Prix at Cannes and a new product called Life Paint for Volvo with a waiting list. So, you've seen Brazil recreating in Billingsgate. Life Paint, old people snogging, a tiger in a young man's bedroom, and a hard man in a bad camel coat teaching the world to save a life. All linked by one open agency trying its hardest every day to make famous, effective work. This was Grey London in three minutes and we're done. So I've got one other kind of slide which is a, a boasting slide and, and the point of it isn't to say how great we were. Um, the point of it is uh, to say that I think planners can make great CEOs because um, I think a lot of people still have questions about that and that was one of the things I was terrified of actually when I first took the job. I'd seen, um, I'd experienced a shit, um, a shit CEO planner, if that makes sense for myself. Um, and I was really worried. I could list on, you know, one hand, certainly the people who'd done it really badly. So I genuinely had that spectre in my mind of, oh God, are you sure I should do this? But um, we had a, a really good run. And as I say, we won a bucket load of awards for both effectiveness and uh, creativity. We also went, uh, I think, from 20th in the new business tables to number two. I think it might have been behind VCC actually. Um, and our margins went up, our profit went up, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and when I resigned, I'd actually just been offered the job to run Europe, um, which I definitely knew I didn't want to do, and it was about time I did my own thing. Um, but just to say, I think, you know, that if that doubt is in your head, there are, I think, an increasing number of examples of planners making good CEOs. So it should be about the, the choice, uh, rather than, you know, oh God, I can't do it. But the truth is, just, uh, just like Sophie, I never planned to be CEO. In fact, I didn't have a plan at all. Um, I come from a kind of hilariously upper middle class Scottish family, and there have been a load of blokes who've either got you drunk like him, uh, Andrew Clark, if you go to Singapore, there's a bit of Singapore named after him because he was the governor. Uh, so Murray Souter uh, was one of the guys who uh, really was responsible for being, bringing in the tank and uh, founding the fleet air arm, so they were good at killing people as well. And the last one was my granddad, who was um, the Queen's doctor and set up the uh, uh, Committee of Safety of Drugs, which is now NICE. So they've kind of done amazing stuff, uh, but no one in my family who was female had ever had a job before. <laughs> So I really didn't have a plan at all, and I didn't have any expectations and no sort of sense of role models. And I went to a kind of boring girls boarding school in Dorset, and I think the, um, the write-up in Tatler or Harpers and Queen was something like, nice school, nice girls in the West Country, quite good at music, good marriers. <laughs> And somewhat amusingly, exactly the same as Sophie, when I went to the career service, they told me I should be a librarian. <laughs> so there's a running theme. Um, but you know, it was, I think, a similar thing. I wasn't as organized as going and asking for psychometric tests. When I got to Oxford and it was my final year, I thought I want to come to London and hang out with my mates. I went to the career service and luckily advertising begins with an A. <laughs> so it was the first career I thought, oh, that sounds quite fun. Um, so yeah, 
I think that's a good thing. Um, so my advice to you would be um, having half a plan is plenty. Um, there's a, I think he's a 19th century uh, German field marshal called something like Helmut von Kulte or something, who said no plan uh, survives contact with the enemy. And Mike Tyson said it a little bit more pithily when he said, um, everyone's got a plan till they get punched in the face. Um, and I think that's kind of true in life. Um, and I think I learned that as a planner, actually. It's pretty true for what goes on for brands as well. Uh, half a plan is enough. If you have a really tight plan, it's, it's disastrous. It only leads to disappointment. Um, and my half a plan was pretty much do what you like try and do it with people you like, and never have the same year twice. Um, so that was uh, as formal as my plan has ever been, and I stick by it today, and it's still what I make decisions on. Um, and it neatly leads into, particularly the never have the same year twice, leads you pretty directly into that mm, tension that I think we all uh, are constantly faced with about you know, what are, what are my strengths, what am I good at, and what are my limits? Um, and I think there is a real tension there. And as planners, I think we're really good at that, actually, usually. We're good at applying it to other things, anyhow. We're very good at sitting down, figuring out what is essential in a brand, what's absolutely cool to a brand, where can it stretch, what else could it do, where can we pull it, what's it really good at? Um, but I just don't think we've been historically very good at applying that to ourselves. And I think that is one of the things that, you know, that if you apply a planning brain to yourself, um, that is uh, quite a powerful thing to do, try and figure out where you can stretch to. So, I would say though that planners, I think, are, oh, I don't know, well, I don't know whether it's planners or women, um, but certainly, um, you know, it's one of those things that I think I've definitely been guilty of in my career is pigeonholing myself and actually going, oh, this is the only thing I'm good at, so I better stick to that in case I get found out. Um, so I, I would say I think my natural bias is to assume um, that I can't do it rather than I can do it. Um, so I think, you know, we need to push ourselves, just as we'd always be looking at a brand, thinking where else could it go, that's sort of how you should be looking at yourself. Um, Gary Stolkin wrote, uh, oh, he wrote this article, I think it was in, oh, 2014, there we go. It was the year, uh, it was certainly, God, it was, I think it was just after I'd taken over as CEO, he wrote a piece about why there aren't more female CEOs and why there aren't more female CEOs leading networks, not just, um, not just agencies. Um, and he talked about the fact that in his entire career, you know, he'd never had a bloke going up to him saying, I've been offered this gig as CEO, should I take it? Do you think I can do it? Um, and he'd had uh, uh, quite a number of women do that. I was one of them, and one of my best friends who uh, was chief exec of uh, Publicis and is now chairman of Publicis was another one, and I'm sure there are more like us. So uh, uh, just be aware of that. I think it's a, a shame if, if we limit it. Um, the third thing I think, you know, there is genuinely you are kind of faced with a bit blank paper syndrome when you take over as CEO. Because I think when you've been a planner, you've been used to having your agenda set for you. And it can be quite terrifying when you suddenly go, oh fuck, I'm the one setting the agenda. Um, and for me, I found it really reassuring to be able to think, oh, I've got a bunch of models I've used all through my career. Let's try and use some of those, and they'll help me figure out what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, because I do think they help, massively help. And I think planners have more of those at their fingertips than most CEOs I know. And I think one of the biggest challenges um, you have as CEO is trying to balance uh, the now and the next. And, you know, totally to Sophie's point, it's a firefighting job, and you are consistently being called about some piece of shit, and it is very much a reactive job. And it is very easy, I think, to get sucked into just focusing on the here and now. Um, and in my case, when I took over, 
we had an almighty multi-million pound hole to fill um, because we had won Volvo the year before and it had been a centralised account worth several million in revenue um, and fee and uh, they then decided, oh, actually, well, we don't really want a centralised model after all. We're going to realign it all back um, from the hub, which was London, to the local markets. London, you're just going to do a bit of Europe stuff and some London stuff. So I had a massive fucking hole and, you know, definitely I was staring down the barrel of making 70 people redundant. Um, so that's quite a kind of like, oh, OK, this is what being a CEO is going to be like. Um, but it was very clear that the only way out of it was to pitch our way out of it. So I kind of went, right, I'm going to sit down with our CMO, who I booted quite fast and got somebody else in, make a really awesome new business plan, re-engineer every single bit of our new business process and go at it because I don't want to be the person who's, you know, in your first six months as CEO is the one who has to say, right, we've fucked up a bit, we're going to lose 70 people and it's going to be miserable. So, um, so I think, you know, what I would say is the models really helped. I did map the customer journey of a pitch and actually sit down and figure out, you know, what the mindset was at each stage and could we be doing things differently, blah, blah, blah. Um, but as well as that, I um, didn't stop thinking about the next, and almost the next was my little, ooh, place of comfort, planning happy place. Um, and again, it was very much about applying all those kind of models. I mean, I used to use the five C's, analyze, you know, the usual shit we all do, company, category, context, consumer, culture, and try and figure out what we should be doing. Um, and what we should be doing next. And that for me was quite nice, it was quite comforting, but I also think it's invaluable because when you've got a massive hole and when you've got loads of firefighting, your tendency is just to stay there. But when the industry is in the state it's in right now, you can't afford to not be looking around the corner. And I think that's one of the reasons, maybe, why there are more CEOs who are coming from a strategic background because we are more used to looking at that disruption. Um, and that is absolutely something that the industry is facing. So um, the other thing, uh, you know, I was a classic planner. I treated it like a pitch. And I went, I'm going to go and do my research. Um, and the lovely thing is that people in this industry are incredibly nice. Um, so I did call lots of favors and say, I played on it shamelessly. I went, I'm a woman and I'm a planner. I haven't got any idea what I'm doing. Can I come and have a chat? <laughs> and amazingly, pretty much everyone said, yeah, I'll give you an hour and tell you what I think um, makes you know the difference, what I think being a C great CEO is. And I got some amazing tips from, uh, from Zilla, from Ben Fennell, and from Marco Rimini, and they were all super, super helpful to me. So. I think that is one of the things that actually, again, I'm not sure other CEOs would have done that, but I treated it like going off to go and do my research, and it was great. Um, the fourth thing, you see, I, I guess I differ from Sophie on this. I think I was always quite interested in um, how my clients made money. Um, and again, I think because I'd been at an agency which had had such a turbulent time, um, DDB had been through real ups and downs. I was really conscious of uh, that kind of sense of how to follow the money. What does a P&L look like? Which accounts are profitable? Why isn't that? Why are we still doing that one if that one isn't profitable? How come? Oh, wow! The states has way higher margins than Europe does. How's that? Ooh. So I'd spent quite a lot of time, I guess within my planning career, actually thinking about following the money. Um, so I don't know whether that makes me just greedy and horrible or what, but anyway, um, I think it's really useful advice. So um, I guess a bit like um, most other people, I figured out quite fast by looking at the P&Ls because I was in a, effectively a group role because we had Grey, the advertising agency, we had Grey Shopper, 
We had, um, God, I've forgotten all of them now. Uh, <laughs> we had Grey Possible, which was our digital joint venture. We had Grey Works, which was our production joint venture. We had Grey Social, which was our social venture. Um, and I sat down and actually kind of went, okay, what do we need to do? Because what became very apparent also was there isn't a lot to grow when you're just looking at the traditional ad agency. There's only so many sectors. Once you've filled up clients in all of those sectors, you've got to find other ways to grow. Um, so for me, it was how can we expand our digital, our production? Actually, because production, the scary thing is the margins in something like a, a Hogarth are 40%. And you're like, oh my god, they're making so much money. Excellent, let's do more of that. And then we can all, you know, have more fun somewhere else. Um, you know, so you become quite fast at looking at that kind of stuff. And we also launched, well, they launched just after I'd left, actually, a new um, data and response offerings and a media offering. Um, so those were things I'd sort of planned while I was there. So I think that's a real classic planning skill as well. That is, follow the money and figure out where the hell else your brand can extend to if its core can't grow anymore. So again, I'd say that's a planning thing. Um, this, I thought, was kind of an interesting and slightly scary chart. Um, it's percentages of GDP. So manufacturing, as we all know, has gone to shit. Um, we are basically run by bankers who are all, all now going to fuck off because of Brexit. Um, and we're left trogging along at the bottom. Um, and, and the challenging thing, I think, for us is that increasingly loads of other people are encroaching on our space. Um, so uh, you just look at Obviously, digital's the fastest growing bit of the business. Um, you look at how fast it's growing uh, on the black line, but you look at what's happening in terms of uh, the big six, which is big six holding companies, their share of that. Um, massively, you know, Gaffer are taking our lunch in terms of digital ad spend, and then you're seeing the growth of all the consultancies like the Accentures of the world. So, um, you know, we knew, we absolutely need to make, find new ways to make money um, as a business. And that is a really great planning challenge, I think. Um, I don't think that's a CEO challenge, I think that's a planning challenge. And one of our big clues, I think, was um, life paint. Uh, so, some of you probably saw the, big, the end of that video was lovely Volvo life paint. Um, it was a weird thing that we did because we got briefed for a car, the car didn't exist yet. We wanted to talk about safety and safety outside the car because it had a IntelliSafe feature that kind of meant, you know, you could see what was going on outside the car as well as in. And we were trying to figure out what to do on a 70k budget when we didn't have a car to shoot and we had nothing to talk about. Um, so we did life paint. Um, the Scandi team figured out that actually um, the biggest uh, cause of road accidents in Sweden, which is of course where Volvo comes, is elk. And there is a weird paint that you spray on elks that lights up in car headlights. And they went, ooh, can we steal that and do that for bikes in London? So that was the idea. But the interesting thing about it was that we um, then did a deal with a Swedish startup to produce this. We branded it, we made the cans, da 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 da. And um, as a result, we now get a pound every time one of those is sold um, in the agency. So it's suddenly like, oh, that's an interesting model. How can we be doing more of that kind of stuff where we have licensing deals or other kinds of sweat equity deals, or whatever it is, what other things can we be doing uh, which mean that we're not all as reliant on timesheets as we currently are? So that was one of the big things, and I think it chimed as well with a um, great piece of data which I kind of re-dug out. When I joined the industry, it was around here, so the ads were as good as the programmes on TV, and I single-handedly that turned it to shit and now everyone hates what we do. I mean, obviously, I think that's as much to do with the fact telling is a little better than it was back in the 90s.
But it's interesting that I don't think it's you know, inconceivable to think about an ad-free future or a future where you know, it's only poor people who have to watch advertising and rich people pay not to. Um, and I think those kind of scenarios, which are the kind of classic scenarios, the what-if scenarios that planners like to play with, are really useful ones for CEOs today. Um, so I do think it is, right, what else can we be doing that people really love, um, that we're going to get paid for? So, last point, um, become a planager, not just a planner. Um, I think I've always been terrible at organising stuff. Um, and I don't think that's ever going to change. Nils has tried to uh, um, set off the contents of my desk quite regularly because it's so messy. Um, but one of the things you do realise is um, you get a very good PA. That's one of the first things I did, was hire a fantastic PA who could organise my life for me. Um, so there are always ways around um, being disorganised. Um, another thing I wasn't particularly, you know, it's not my natural thing to kind of jump to pick up the phone, but I think you fairly fast realise um, that the quicker you speak to somebody about a problem, the better. And you just have to steal yourself to do it. It's not a great planning skill, but it is something you have to learn. And I think it's something you have to learn if you're going to rise in planning, frankly, too. Um, and then this sort of general sense of human relationships are messy and demanding. And, and I think that's, you know, that's absolutely true. And as a CEO, you have to deal with the worst and messiest bits quite often. Um, but again, I think, uh, you know, two things I would say is, one, you don't have to do it on your own. So the, the, similarly to Sophie, the first two things I did was to... Uh, make somebody chief client officer so that they picked up more of the crap than I did. <laughs> and the second thing I did was to uh, promote Natalie and make her MD. Um, so again, I kind of know enough to know that I need a team around me who can compensate for where I'm shit. Um, and the other thing, in terms of dealing with a mess of people, I think we all forget that in abstract, we're brilliant at this. We all intuitively know loads of stuff from behavioural economics. We know people are emotional. We have great empathy genes. If you're a good planner, you have to have used that empathy muscle for years and years and years. I mean, you know, I've had to do campaigns with 60-year-olds who love cleaning or, you know, whatever it is. I've never done it for me. Um, so you have to be great at empathy as a planner, and I think that takes you at least half the way into being a great CEO, because it means you can actually sort of empathise with, with the crap people are going through. Now, I would never say I'm brilliant at the next bit of it, which is the inspiring bit of it. So I think you have to understand and have that empathy, and then you have to have the ability to inspire. And again, I'm really fortunate in that my old business partner, Nils, who's our creative, and he's one of the people I'm setting up in business with, is fantastic at that bit of the job. So, you know, we know that we can, we can do this together. So that, I think, is, is it. But I, what I would say is, I'm going into, I guess, a hybrid role where I'm being founding an agency, so you need a bit of everything, frankly. But I would say having been a CEO definitely makes me a better planner. And having been a planner, I would say, was a massive advantage as a CEO. I'm going to whiz through these, but I think we forget all too often that we're unique as planners in having this kind of interesting point on the intersection between culture and commerce, between people and business. And that's so valuable. Because you look at all the consultants and stuff like that, I've worked a load with McKinsey's and Accenture and Bay. They're crap at the culture bit of this. They're okay at the commerce bit, but they're shit at the other bit. And that is largely because, you know, their default position is logic. It's spreadsheets, it's numbers, it's systems. And great planners are really good at being able to do both. Um, and I think that's what makes us super special. Again, I think planners are really good at looking back in from the past and projecting into the future and starting to see around the corner. 
And I think, again, that's one of our superpowers that I think a lot of other people aren't good at. Um, and finally, it's really interesting, having spent, you know, oh God, nearly a year of my non-competing gardening leave doing weird crap with other people, um, outside the industry, what I've figured out is that we have a very privileged position because we get to see how businesses in every different sector work, whether it's governments, the public sector, whether it's charities, whether it's verticals like, you know, telco or whatever. No other businesses get to see that. They all have to specialise in one vertical, whereas we get to see how it works across the board. And I don't think we make nearly enough of that. And it's such a privileged position. And it makes our job, I think, endlessly fascinating. So last slide. This is just to say, really, I'd like you to all leave thinking what an amazing training planning is. This is all the different stuff that I know planners have gone on to do. So Myla was a sex toys and underwear business that was set up by mate mine who was a planner at um, Lowe's. Wren, um, some of you may have used their stuff. That was set up by a planner from BNP, Atheist Shoes, and um, another shoe company, Seven Feet Apart. There's clearly something with shoes and planners. Um, Tony McGuinness in the middle there is a DJ and runs another thing. Nuji and Percolate are both tech businesses set up by planners I know. There are planners who've been authors, as you can see, kids' books, other books, serious books. Um, uh, there's also quite a few journalists in terms of TV, so I don't know if any of you know um, Mrs. Money Penny, who's written for the FT for years and did super scrimpers and weird crap like that. Um, she was a planner at BMP, as was Fiona Bruce of the telly, the news. She was a planner at BMP. Um, there have been city analysts, actors, writers, and CMOs. And, you know, when you talk to any of them, they all talk about what a great grounding being a planner was because of that unique viewpoint you get between people and business. So, that's it. I think it's a really good job to do. Thank you.